I guess I'm here because on the strength of a book I published a few years ago called Ecological Ethics and Introduction. Um, however, oh yes, and I also edit a, an online, free online journal, which I can highly recommend called The Ecological Citizen. Yeah, you can access it, find it quite easily. But I also, my last two jobs were in study religions departments at, uh, at Bath, Spa and University of Kent. So I also have a long-standing interest in spiritual spirituality. So um, what I'm gonna say overlaps to some extent with Jack's excellent overview, um, but I wanna add some other things as well. There, there, there can't be any doubt about the destruction and degradation of the of the uh, remaining ecosystems on the earth. And if, uh, if I think it's, it can be defended, the idea can be defended that measures of biodiversity are measures of how much life and vitality and richness, uh, biologically speaking, there is, then anything that drives that down and destroys it, I think is something to be resisted. And uh, not just for our sake, obviously. Um, but for all the other countless other beings that we share the planet with that we forget about far too easily. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we are one of those animals. We are an ecological embodied embedded animal just as much as any other animal. We are just as dependent on uh, having food to eat that's edible, having drinkable water, breathable air, shelter, all those ecological concerns. Um, and the fact that we go on to develop our abilities to do things like build nuclear power stations um, that um, melt down and so on. Uh, sure, they're natural in a technical sense, uh, but they're pathology, they're natural pathology. So a cancer cell is perfectly natural, but it's pathological. Or you might say it's self-destructive. It's nature being self-destructive, if that's what we wanna be. Well, I don't think I do but uh, it's certainly possible. Um, so uh, the name for this, these processes, uh, there is a name for, I'll be concerned with names. I think it's quite important to give, give things good names uh, so you can help you think about them. Uh, the name for this entire concatenation of crises, climate crisis, mass extinctions, biodiversity, pollution, and so on, I think a good name is ecocide. And what is the cause, the, the fundamental cause of ecocide? I think I, I would describe it as it's, it's, it's a direct result of overwhelming human impact on the planet. Um, there are simply too many human beings engaged in too many ecologically harmful activities on this limited planet. And uh, the situation is such now, it's so serious now, that um, some of the things that are needed, and Jack described some of them, which overlap with my list, but my list would go something like, uh, not only weaning economies off the insanity of endless growth, which of course endless growth on a limited planet is, as it has been described, the logic of the cancer cell. And not only greening production, the way things are produced, but reducing consumption, which is a political you know, nightmare. And politicians just won't go there. They won't promise their, the voters that they're gonna, not gonna be able to consume as much as they want, whenever they want, of whatever kind. Um, bringing down carbon emissions, of course, which are still rising despite the Paris Agreement, uh, drastically cutting back on meat eating. I mean, that's an absolute no-brainer. Whether you look at meat eating ethically, ecologically, health-wise, it's a disaster. Um, stopping the conversion of whatever remains of wild forest to human use, banning plastics, a moratorium on so-called development. I love this word, development. You know, makes it sound like, yeah, that's got to be a good thing, right? Uh, no. Um, Rewilding and keeping at least a third of the planet 
as wild nature. Now that immediately, that concept gets attacked by people who are against it by saying, um, oh, well, there's nothing wild left uh, anymore. Human impacts are uh, extend throughout the entire uh, planet, even the Arctic and the Antarctic. Yeah, but there is such a thing still as relatively wild nature. Wild nature is nature that hasn't been completely instrumentalized to solely human purposes. And there, are, there, are, there is wild nature. There's even a bit of it left in the British Isles here and there, okay? Has not been wholly instrumentalized. It's simple. Um, a very important thing to do is to radically increase female education, female empowerment, and access to free birth control. Uh, both because it's a good thing, it's a, a good in itself, and in order to start to humanely reduce uh, the human overpopulation, which is a really serious problem that can no longer be swept under the carpet. Um, if, you, if we do not start to bring the human population down, you could reduce con consumption to the point of barely bare livability, and it wouldn't be enough because there'd simply be too many people with their perfectly valid, legitimate, minimal needs. But you get past a certain number, and there goes the so-called environment. Okay. Um, so, oh, and green education. <laughs> Not only courses like this, which is gr are great, but children in schools everywhere should know things like, where does their food come from? How's it grown or killed? If you showed videos of abattoirs, I don't think there'd be a big meat eating problem. Um, uh, where do their wastes go? How's that taken care of? What's the impact of, of all of it? That should be a, a fundamental part of every child's education. Now, the underlying attitude that has got us into this situation and is still driving it forward also has a pretty good name, anthropocentrism. And uh, basically anthropocentrism is the assumption that human beings are either the main source of value in life or the only source of value. Now right away again, and a very common objection to this as well, of course, since we're doing the valuing, that has to be anthropocentric. But that's ridiculous. Because what anthropocentrism is, assert, is an assertion that what we value is hu only humans or human artifacts, etc. Okay? There is there's no reason why what we value cannot be non-human cannot be the rest of nature, cannot be non-human nature, etc. Okay. When what you primarily value, when you find the source of value in the, no the natural world, which includes us, we're natural beings, that's called ecocentrism. Okay. And uh, uh, the way anthropocentrism plays out is that since only human beings are valued, the rest of the natural world either doesn't matter, which means we can do whatever we like to it. So there's no ethical considerations. They don't even need to be looked at. Or it only matters insofar as it benefits us. Yeah, we must protect uh, a certain minimal amount of the environment or number of species or whatever, because otherwise we'll be in trouble. That's still anthropocentric and ultimately not going to work. Why isn't it going to work? Because we grossly underestimate what nature needs to function, let alone flourish. We cut corners. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. And boy, there's a lot of doubt. We use a very short time frame. Well, maybe I'll worry about my kids. Gee, maybe even my grandchildren. Hey, pass that and you're on your own. Okay. And we give in to local politics, local polit political pressures. So basically, actions that are only intended to save us, human beings, are, will continue to connive at the extermination of the remaining wild animals and places. And in the end, they'll fail even in their own terms. Because obviously enough, since we are dependent on the biosphere, completely and utterly dependent on it, 
If the wild earth goes down, so do we. So it's really a pretty much a no brainer. We need to learn to respect and love the earth and our fellow creatures for their own sake, not for ours. That's the attitude of ecocentrism, the view that value inheres in the earth, the biosphere, the entire more than human world. Do you know this term by David Abram, more than human world? It's a lovely term. It means the, the, the entire natural world that includes human beings, but is much just us as well. Okay. Uh, on this basis, on an egocentric basis, the earth and all its beings can provide the context or the horizon for deliberations, policy deliberations, for actions and so on. And really that's the only way there's, that I see any hope whatsoever. Now there was a forerunner to ecocentrism called deep ecology. And uh, it's an honored ancestor, so to speak. Um, but deep ecology from the point of view of ecocentrism made several mistakes in hindsight that we would like to avoid. One mistake it made is to talk about a big self. Well, there is no self without another. It's impossible just for everything to be a self because your self is, is, realizes itself through, through what it is not, okay? And basically this big self is kind of just like egoism and therefore anthropocentrism enlarged to accommodate everything. Just not really a workable idea. Secondly, deep ecology tended to set up a radical opposition between nature and humans, uh, which was touched on earlier in the discussion. But we are animals too, okay? However, there's going to be some unavoidable clashes in certain situations between narrow human interests and the interests of ecosystemic well-being and integrity. There's a bit of remaining old growth forest. This town needs jobs. Well, in that scenario, we can no longer afford the luxury of saying, well, too bad about the forest. Well, we'll replant something as if you could replant an old growth forest. You can't by definition but we'll have jobs for the time being. And well, hey, after that, we'll worry about whatever the next thing is when it, when it comes along. Can't afford that luxury anymore. We have to keep the forest. We have to try and do something about finding those people employment, okay? And retraining and so on. That's the government's responsibility to do that, okay? So when deep ecology says all life has equal value, it ain't gonna fly because it's totally impractical. You cannot ask or expect human beings to treat a smallpox virus with reverence, or even the same way they would treat beavers or tigers. Or, no, it's not going to fly. We, we are going to defend ourselves against fundamental threats to our lives. Okay, So uh, uh, ecocentrism allows for clashes, even though we're all natural beings, it provides some guidance in terms of what has to be done in, in terms of those specific clashes. And it doesn't pretend that all, all life can be treated in practice as having equal value, okay? That's the starting point and that's where you want to end up, but there, there have to be exceptions, okay? So obviously from an ecocentric point of view, we are earthlings. And I think that's a perfectly good term. I really like it, actually. Our very being comes from the earth. It's composed of the earth. And that includes our highest, most sophisticated intellectual, cultural perceptions and creations and aspirations. Those are all creations, aspirations, <laughs> and perceptions of an earth being, of an earthling, okay? And if that, if we extend this to, if reality extends to say divinities, spirits, gods, goddesses, and so on, I believe they too are rooted in and are expressions of them more than human natural world. Graham Harvey, the 
uh, writer on animism or neo-animism is very good on this point. Another thing to notice is that in the approach that I'm describing and advocating, all the important questions are relational. They're all about relationships. There are questions like, is the kind, the kind of relationship between humans and their environment or between humans and these animals, uh, et, et cetera, or between humans and each other, are they healthy relationships? Are they sick relationships? Are they good? In other words, the moment you have questions of relationships, you have questions of ethics. So turning all the natural world in your mind and in our institutionalized mindset into uh, resources, you should always be, an alarm bell should go off if you hear the word resources, okay? Um, is a move, is a political and incidentally metaphysical move to rule out ethics from the beginning. So the question of, is this the right thing to do to kill these animals? Is this the right thing to do to chop down this forest, to, 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 mine, to mine this mineral from the earth, to bring up this? They've been ruled out from the beginning. Why? Because the other party has no life, no agency, no subjectivity. It's dead. It's inert. It's a set of resources. That's what we've been doing to the natural world. It's what we have to stop doing. The moment you stop doing that, ethics is everywhere. And so the question, as I said, is what is the nature or the quality of our relationships with the natural world, with other animals, with each other, as embodied, embedded, interdependent ecological beings? That's where all the work is done and all the play too. Okay, let me talk very briefly about some related views. One is related to ecocentrism. One is ecofeminism, which as it happens, I have a lot of time for and a chapter in my book on. The fundamental text in this con uh, context is uh, Val Plumwood, uh, by Val Plumwood, a book called Feminism and the Mastery of Nature. Can't recommend it too highly. And uh, the basic ecofeminist insight is that the same logic and the same processes which are involved in dominating and suppressing and exploiting the natural world are, are the ones that are used to dominate, suppress, and exploit women. And in practice, they're very, very often completely inseparable. Okay? So uh, what ecofeminism shows us is a very important part of ecocide. Two, anti-capitalism, also very important because, but one reason why it's so important is capitalism is probably the most sophisticated, powerful and successful form of institutionalized anthropocentrism in action that the world has ever seen. And by capitalism, I'm including industrial agriculture, of course. Who benefits from it? Well, only humans. And in practice, of course, only some of those humans. So again, it's anthropocentrism, not ecocentrism. Thirdly, relatedly to the critique of capitalism, there's the anti-consumption, also very important, but it needs to recognize, as I said earlier, that past a certain number of human beings, even leading normal lives and making reasonable demands, all the measures to reduce consumption will fail. Right, let me turn to ecology and spirituality, how they relate to each other. Just let me say a few things about that. I describe uh, in, in another chapter of my book, I talk about post-secular uh, eco ecology or ecologism as post-secular. What do I mean by that? Well, in a way, it's, it's another attempt to move past this uh, branding of the world, of the so-called outer world, as if, <laughs> As if the outer world and the inner world could actually, you know, like, what are they, two different things? Uh, are we still carrying around Descartes on our back? Incredible. Anyway, uh, the outer world as uh, secular. And uh, so religion or spirituality becomes completely privatized. It's only in our head. 
which is ridiculous too, because as if our head isn't out there in the world, as if we could have a mind without a world or a world that exists, the world doesn't exist for us except we're aware of it, okay? So mind and world, and this is all in the work of somebody called Gregory Bateson, who sort of pioneered this, this, uh, this insight, um, although he wasn't the only one, obviously, um, work together. And what I, so what I mean by post-secular is moving past that idea. And also, uh, one of the meanings of spirituality, of course, which I think is a, def a defensible one, is um, ultimate values. Uh, in the case of ultimate values, by which I mean values that cannot be further, uh, further grounded or justified or explained because that's where the process ends. And the philosopher Wittgenstein's metaphor for this was bedrock. When you keep going down at a certain point, you reach bedrock, my spade is turned, I can't go any further down, okay? Well, I think those are uh, legitimately called spiritual values. And um, of course, there are spiritual values which are healthy ecologically, and also ones which are pathological, uh, which, in other words, which are ecocidal. There's two mistakes that can be made in terms of spiritual values that have ecocidal consequences. One is scientific naturalism, which holds that there is nothing spiritual in or about the natural world, not least because there isn't such a thing as spiritual or religious anyway. So how could there be anything like that in the natural world? I call it scientific naturalism. Could also call it materialism. The other mistake is the opposite one, supernaturalism, which thinks, yes, actually agrees there's nothing spiritual in or about nature. So it needs to be taken from somewhere else or something else and added to nature. That's what the word supernatural means, super above nature, natural, naturalism. Okay. Note the agreement between the two, okay? The, the materialists and the, and the idealists and the philosophical sense. There's actually a tacit collaboration between them. They carve up the world in this way. They each have their castes, priestly castes. The materialists have the scientists and the men in white coats and the romantic supernaturalists have the religious authorities. Okay. There is a positive alternative to both of these, uh, which rejects that underlying assumption that the material and spiritual are radically different. Okay. It was expressed by Val Plumwood again. She said, materiality is already italicized, full of form, spirit, story, agency, and glory. I think that's the way to go. And in terms of furthermore, a, a positive, a constructive spiritual apprehension of the natural world, there's at least two general approaches which uh, deserve to be taken seriously. One's called panpsychism and the other is animism. Panpsychism sees mind or soul or consciousness um, in, as inherent in reality and distributed throughout the physical universe, even in the very smallest particles of matter. Okay. The other approach, animism, sometimes also called neo-animism, holds that subjectivity or agency can manifest through and as anything, anything that you can perceive and apprehend, whether that thing is technically alive or not. So in a given situation, a stone um, could be trying to tell you something. Uh, a tree could be trying to tell you something. Um, and so on. It, there's a concept of aliveness or agency or subjectivity which transcends technical biological aliveness, okay, animacy or versus inanimacy. I myself prefer animism because it doesn't really try to lay down the law about ultimate reality, but it recommends a practice. 
namely trying to pay attention and stay open to the manifestations of agency of life in your life as you proceed, as you go through your life. And I also like its emphasis on relationship with other animals, with trees, with stones, with places, etc., indefinitely, so on. Okay. So it's practical, but it's principled, and it's precise, but it's uh, unbounded in that sense. And I think probably that's where I'm going to stop.